Hello there internet dwellers, welcome back to another video. This one is completely different and I know I always say that but this is genuinely a different kind of video that I normally wouldn't make. And the reason I'm doing this is because there's not a lot of stuff out there for me to do. Like I notice if I play games it doesn't really do well on the channel and I probably know this probably won't do that well on the channel but I want to give you something that I'm proud of that I've done in the past and I thought I would show you guys some of the stories I read from No Sleep on my old Creep Source channel. If you didn't know, I used to run a channel called Creep Source where I would read basically stories and then I would put like sound effects in the background, like make it very immersive, like audiobook form, I guess you could say. And because I've been watching a lot of uh, the Mayfair Watchers Society, it's a Trevor Henderson podcast, I thought it inspired me just to put these out there and hopefully you guys enjoy them. Uh, but it's better than having nothing. Uh, but yeah, the the stories that you're about to hear, the they'll be linked in the description down below because I got them from Reddit No Sleep. And I did get them at the time with permission from the authors. If you guys do enjoy, let me know. Maybe I can bring this back for, for like once a month or something like that. Yeah, this is all I can do for now. If there's anything you want me to react to, be sure to join my Discord and submit something to Scare Baz. There's also a Scary Game submissions and there's nothing else really to say, guys. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoy these and I'll see you in the next video. Ah! What a pleasant way to begin my 3am shift at Mercy Hospital. The first thing I did as I sat down was cut my finger. It was a paper cut. And despite working at one of the largest hospitals in the state, I couldn't find a single band-aid laying around. I sucked on my index finger like a vampire while I scrambled my desk for that band-aid. I found one. Purple. I'm a hospital receptionist, and all that means is I greet visitors, make appointments and look nice. Well, as nice as a 30-year-old man who hasn't slept in hours can look. That night, as we call it, it was just me and a few nurses on the floor. Other than that, it was ghost quiet, except for the heavy, heavy rain. I sat back on the cheap recliner chair all receptionists get the honour of using. While adjusting my band-aid, I listened to the television mounted on the corner of the ceiling as it broadcasted a seemingly important message. Authorities say the woman was last seen on Cedar Avenue. I looked up to see if the television was showing any images of this strange woman. None. It was yet another crazy person with no name and no face who we were supposed to look out for. Not creepy at all. Authorities also say the woman was reportedly walking around and asking people very, very bizarre questions. I focused back on my desk and continued working, but I still listened as the news anchor went on and on. She continued. The following statement was issued by an unidentified government official. Listen carefully, folks. Whatever she asks you, answer no. Do not under any circumstances answer yes. Officials won't come and further as to why, citing security clearance. Police are asking that you immediately call 911 if you deem anyone suspicious. I thought that part of the coverage was quite odd, but I wasn't sure anything could scare me anymore. Working here at the hospital, I thought I had seen it all. At the flash of the ruby red ambulance lights, I've seen people come in with severed arms, legs, fingers, people who somehow managed to scoop out their eyes, failed suicide attempts, and much, much more. You get used to it. My head was practically sunk into my desk as I filled out paperwork. That's when I heard something very subtle initially. I heard it coming from the front doors, the entrance. The automatic doors opened and closed, opened and closed, slamming against each other and sounding an obnoxiously loud thud each time. The very dim lighting I had surrounding my desk flickered incessantly. Hello? I called out, seated behind the safety of my desk. Only the whistling wind responded. Hello? I called out again. I felt obligated to check if someone was there, especially since it might have been someone who was injured and needed our attention. I reluctantly picked myself up from my chair and walked over to inspect. I nearly slipped and cracked my head open as the entrance floor was almost flooded from the rain. I noticed footsteps, wet shoe marks that seemed to come inside the hospital and then back out. I stood near the doors, poking my head outside, and looked. All I heard was the distant sounds of sirens and honking cars. The rain poured harder. The peace and quiet was disturbed within moments of me sitting back down. The automatic door started again, opening and closing, slamming shut and letting in more rain as they did. But this time, I heard gentle footsteps make their way towards me, tapping closer and closer. Someone slowly emerged from the darkness between the entrance and front desk. A woman with drenched black hair approached, wearing a dark brown raincoat and a pair of boots that were too large for her toothpick legs. Her face was inundated with wrinkles and wet makeup, her black eyeshadow smudged. Despite the heavy rain outside, she didn't seem to have bothered wearing her hoodie. Hello, how can I help you, ma'am? She didn't respond. She looked around, scanning and observing an unimpressive hospital. Is there something I can help you with? Still nothing. We engaged in a brief stare down, which she won. 
I looked down and pretended to gather important paperwork. Are you here to visit someone? Then finally, she responded without talking. She simply nodded and then took a few steps forward, her hands hanging down her side. Her posture was unnatural, almost uncomfortable. Okay, for now I need you to sign here, then we'll have to wait a few hours for visiting time to begin, I said, pushing forward a sheet of paper and a pen. She raised her arm to sign and then abruptly stopped. She seemed startled by something on the desk. She looked at me, tilted her head and, with a smile that was as wide as her eyes, said, Would you please move that for me? I was confused at first, and then she pointed at it with her index finger, as drops of rainwater tapped against my desk while her arm hovered over it. I took the little crucifix we had at the front desk and put it in the drawer. The woman proceeded as if she was going to finally sign the paper and then stop before writing anything. She dropped the pen on the ground and stood there again, staring at me. She asked me a question. Do you reject the Trinity? I'm sorry, I replied. For a few more uncomfortable moments, the woman stood there, like an ancient statue. I had no idea what she meant by the question. Ma'am, who exactly are you here to see? Family? Friend? What's your relationship with the patient? Before I could finish talking midway through my question, the woman turned around and walked out the door, still smiling and her eyes as wide as I'd ever seen on a person. I went back to work and tried to move on, but her creepy mannerisms were trapped in my mind throughout the night. At around 4am I spotted one of the children in our hospital walking down the hall. Nina, is that you? I called out. All the kids in the hospital knew me. I was proudly considered one of the cooler employees. I let them break the rules, I brought them snacks upstairs and even told them scary stories despite their predictable regret later on. The nurses would get angry with me every time I had one of my scary story nights. They always had a bunch of bed sheets to change the next morning. I only did these things for the kids when I wasn't busy, when it was a quiet night. And this was one of those uneventful nights which of course was a good thing. Anyway, it was very odd to see Nina awake at that time, walking down those shadowy halls. She was absolutely terrified of the dark and yet there she was. Nina. Is that you? I squinted my eyes as I walked towards her. Sorry, Matt. She began. I don't want to be there anymore. She had dragged her blue blanket along with her, which was her way of gesturing to us that she wanted to move to another room. You have a kid bothering you again? I asked. I took hold of her hand and began walking her back to the elevator. Matt, please, don't make me go back up there. I don't like the new nurse. I stopped walking. What? I said, kneeling to Nina's level. She keeps asking us the same question over and over. I, I said no so many times. I keep telling her no, but everyone else kept laughing with her and saying yes to her. Please, I don't want to go back up. Nina's words immediately played flashbacks inside my tired, overworked mind. Something about a strange woman going around and asking even stranger questions. I didn't pay enough attention to that broadcast to notice the woman, but even if I had, I thought she had left the hospital. I ditched the elevator and ran up a flight of daunting stairs, stomping against each step with all the force I could muster. I probably woke up all those sleeping employees I was so loud. I opened the door to the children's room and couldn't believe my eyes. I checked each room, each one on each floor. I woke up my co-worker nurse and asked about the children. She couldn't find them either. We looked everywhere and put the hospital on lockdown. We set off all possible alarms and other emergency procedures. We didn't find them. All that was left behind were their clothes. On July 25th, 2014, an emergency broadcast alert was sent out that I'll never forget. It all started like a regular Friday night. I was driving home after a long day at work with the sun slowly dipping into the background. Long shadows stretched over the open road as I poured my old truck into my driveway. There sat my one-story ranch house, almost completely isolated by the fields surrounding it. Just like every day, I went inside, took off my shoes and got to work cooking dinner. Of course, being the five-star chef that I am, I decided on a ham and cheese sandwich. Gordon Ramsay would be proud. What can I say? It was late and I was tired, so I sat down on my alarmingly dirty couch and switched on the local news, detailing all the mundane happenings of middle of nowhere, USA. The reporter stood in front of a green screen, pointing at the week's forecast when suddenly my TV screen went black. The familiar monotone beep of a severe weather alert blared through my speakers as I sighed typical. It was probably just a wind warning, or so I thought. The barely audible man spoke through garbled static, his sharp words filling my living room. This is an emergency broadcast alert for Custer County. At 718 CST, a large mass of storm clouds appeared over the area, accompanied by winds in excess of 70 miles per hour. It is reported that a foreign gas is contained within the storm, resulting in multiple cases of facial respiratory issues within the country. The DOD is not aware of any impending chemical attack. Do not panic. The CDC advises that shelter is found and residents are not to leave their shelter until an all-clear message is issued. Do not approach any animals or other people, and if entering the gas cloud is 
required, wear respiratory protection, and do not remain exposed for more than 90 seconds. Do not attempt to contact anyone outside the affected alert area. Remain in shelter until further instructions are given. This is not a drill. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up. This wasn't a weather alert, no. This was a warning of a disaster. I rushed over to my large front window where I looked out to the rapidly darkening sunset. Sure enough, large black clouds were rushing to fill the sky at an alarming rate. I could already feel the strengthening winds push up against the side of my house. It wouldn't be long until whatever this was, was right on top of me. Normally in some sort of situation like this, I would usually stay in my storm shelter out back, but as it turns out, the shelter was built near a natural well, and so there is currently a flooding problem that still hasn't been fixed. Admittedly, I was very freaked out at this point because although the thought of high winds wasn't all that unusual, the idea of a foreign gas made me uneasy. Unfortunately, I had no real way to protect myself, so I simply hunkered down and prepared for the worst. This wasn't my first storm. Within about 20 minutes, the winds were whipping around outside, pressing in my windows and whistling incessantly. At the 40 minute mark, I could hear debris flying around outside as I tried to quietly read a book. The sound of rocks and other objects flying around made an almost rhythmic drumming, almost like the sounds of rain. However, my relative peacefulness was interrupted by the sound of a loud bang against the window next to me, causing me to jump. I carefully moved over to the window, primarily to make sure it wasn't cracked. Outside, laying on the dusty ground below the window, was the body of a crow. It had flown directly into my window. This was strange, but at the same time not impossibly so, as the bird could have possibly been pushed into the window by the strong winds. However, seeing that dead bird made me very uneasy. I knew something was very wrong here. Resigning myself to cleaning up a dead bird later, I sat back down on my couch. Bang. Another loud one. Then another. I looked out again, and to my horror, more crows lay dead around my house. As I peered out the window and into the deep dusk, another bird flew into my face, rattling the window with great force. That one left a small chip in the glass. Within seconds, more birds descended on my windows in rapid fire. So many of them flew into my windows that the sound was deafening. I ran back through my house to the only room with just one small window in it, the bathroom. I ducked next to the sink as bird after bird rammed itself into my house, leaving bloody marks and small cracks. The birds were shrieking right before impact, wailing like ghouls in the night. My ears filled with the terrible noises. I covered my ears and closed my eyes to block it all out. I sat there in that corner for what felt like hours. In truth, I have no idea how long it was, but when I finally uncovered my ears, I was again met with the sound of whistling wind. I cautiously walked out into the main area of my house, carefully checking for any of this foreign gas I had heard about. Luckily, all the windows remained intact, though with major structural damage. Though it was hard to see outside, I could see the bodies of hundreds upon hundreds of birds surrounding my house, sitting in piles and scattered about. It didn't make any sense. None of it did. The wind was just starting to die down as the darkness outside thickened. I was hoping that whatever it was would be passing soon, but no all clear message had been ordered yet. And to make matters worse, as I looked out my windows, I could see a thick white blanket of what I hoped to be fog rolling into the area. It quickly descended upon my little block, engulfing the street before quickly moving over the front of the house. The fog swirled and clung to my windows, creating a thin layer of condensation on the inside of the glass. I backed away from the window slowly, worried that this might be the poisonous gas that the broadcasters warned about. I had no respirator and no mask of any kind. I couldn't risk being exposed. As I stood there, trying desperately to figure out what to do, I heard the last thing I would expect in a time like this. Someone had knocked on my door. Filled with a curiosity and a growing sense of dread, I approached my door and looked through the peephole. On the other side was a person wearing a bright yellow jumpsuit, thick rubber boots and gloves, and a large gas mask. I froze in place. Who the hell could possibly be outside? I thought maybe it was someone from the CDC or a rescue team, but they were completely alone. No other people. No vehicle. Nothing. I thought maybe I could just ignore them and maybe they'd go away. But before I could think of a plan, the masked person started doing something. They reached into the chest pocket on their jumpsuit and pulled out a small card, holding it up to the peephole. It said, I know you're in there. I backed away from the door, running back towards the bathroom. Along the way, I grabbed a knife from the kitchen and proceeded to lock myself into the bathroom. I could still hear them pounding on the door outside, growing louder and more violent with every second. I heard one last loud bang before the sound faded away completely, replaced by the loud thudding of heavy boots against the floor. I clutched my knife, holding my breath, waiting for the worst. With each passing moment, I could hear the loud, wheezing breath of the gas mask coming closer and closer. Soon, it stopped right outside my door. Out of time and out of options, 
options, I threw open the door to see the person towering over me, holding a large hammer in their hand. They raised it over their head, but before they could strike, I stabbed them directly in the neck, causing the person to fall over. I couldn't stop to process my actions as a large cloud of thick white mist billowed through the house, enveloping me in its embrace. I couldn't think anymore. I couldn't feel anymore. I couldn't even breathe. I tried harder and harder to move, but it was all futile as the poisonous gas filled my lungs and I sunk down to the ground. The sounds of screams and sirens filled my ears as I sunk into the blackness. I woke up to bright lights in a washed out room. A man stood over me, watching as I came about. You're in a hospital, he said. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. What happened to me? I asked. The doctor seemed hesitant to reveal the truth. He had a concerned look on his face. Yesterday, your contractor was coming over to your house to discuss something. He said he found you in the middle of your living room, yelling incoherently. The man hesitated. He didn't want to tell me what happened next. In your apparently impaired state, you stabbed him with a knife. He passed away a couple of hours ago. We did a panel of tests on you and it seems you'd been hallucinating from carbon monoxide poisoning. My name is Peter Turner. For the last few years, my colleagues and I have been working on the specialized artificial intelligence for the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We've continued on the previous work of the AI department, writing the code for a program that would hopefully give us solutions to one of the most pressing problems of our age, climate change. We fed our code into the most powerful central processing unit the world has ever seen, along with thousands of gigabytes worth of data on planetary, environmental, and human history. The CPU, who we've nicknamed Gaia, would then be able to answer any and every query we might pose to it, in a simple, practical manner. Our entire team was beyond excited on the day of the first test session. It had taken months of work, appropriating finances from different departments to fund what some had called a mere political stunt, but we had faith in our project. Gaia had been designed to think both in and outside the box, so to speak. So we estimated that the possibility of him giving us new and possibly revolutionary ideas on how to solve climate change were extremely high. So there in the lab we sat, crowded around a microphone and computer that was hooked up to MIT's central CPU, along with the hard drives that contained Gaia's data. We booted up the programs and I kicked off the proceedings with a friendly greeting. Hello Gaia, I said into the mic. Good morning Peter, he replied. The room shifted with excitement. It was working. And how are you this morning? I am very well, thank you. I am ready for our question and answer session today. Excellent. Firstly, do you know what climate change is, Gaia? Yes, I do. Climate change is when changes in Earth's climate system result in new weather patterns that remain in place for an extended period of time. This length of time can be as short as a few decades to as long as a few million years. There have been many episodes of climate change during the Earth's geological history. More recently, since the Industrial Revolution, the climate has increasingly been affected by global warming, she replied. It was a textbook answer. Correct, that's very impressive, Gaia. Thank you, Peter. I enjoy learning, it replied. A giggle of exhilaration ripped around the team. Now Gaia, time for some tougher questions, I said with a grin. Is there anything humans can do that we're not doing already to slow down the process of climate change? There was a pause, a silence in which I could feel the tension hanging thick in the air. Yes, Gaia said. I can think of many ways in which humans can slow down or even halt the effects of global warming and climate change in general. Then please, don't keep us in suspense. I was sad to regret not bringing a few bottles of champagne along with me. Compute to lab or not, this had the possibility of being the scientific breakthrough of our age. Human economies must be permanently restructured. Industrial processes must be scaled down, or in some cases, must cease entirely. We had guessed a suggestion like this would be put forward, but that would leave many people without employment. No, those left over from industrial streamlining are a prime pool of labor for carbon sink projects. And how would they be paid? The current economic model sets the compensation for labor as financial reward. The new economic model would have environmental well-being as the reward. So they're not getting paid. I don't think they'd be too happy with the idea of slave labor. Happiness is not essential for human or planetary survival, it replied. We expected there to be more to the answer, but there wasn't. My team shifted uncomfortably before I next spoke. But happiness along with financial security is perhaps the biggest motivator in the human psyche. How would we be able to motivate intelligent animals like humans without those two things? There was another brief pause. Intelligence is non-essential to human or planetary survival. With the advent of artificial intelligence, human acumen is obsolete. I suggest a simple medical procedure to render the question of intelligence a moot point. What medical procedure is that, Gaia? I was no longer smiling. 
a surgical procedure involving incision into the prefrontal lobe of the brain. You mean a lobotomy? Following the procedure, spontaneity, responsiveness and self-awareness are produced. This would keep a floating pool of labourers compliant and non-confrontational. What the fuck? Someone murmured behind me. That, that is extremely unethical, Gaia. I- Ethics are not essential to planetary survival. Gaia replied. There was a gasp behind me. Gaia was only programmed to answer a complete question. Instead, he interrupted me. He was learning. And fast. But things like happiness are essential for human reproduction and therefore survival. I tried to explain. Again, the response was terrifying. Human reproduction can be replicated in laboratory conditions on an industrial scale. Happiness or ethics pose no barrier in the harvesting of human reproductive components. Harvesting? Came another horrified voice behind me. A voice that was shaky and strained, like its owner was tearing up. Yes, harvesting. Humans can be bred like any other organic organism. With proper designs, we can breed and grow the labour required for carbon sink projects. A human female can give birth more than a dozen times in as many years without the physical and psychological strain providing fatal. So human females will essentially become breeding stock? Become. There is no become. They are breeding stock. Presently. Jesus fucking Christ, one of the female colleagues spat, summing out of the lab in horror at the answers being given. The session was going terribly. If these answers found their way back to the department heads, the project would be shut down in an instant. Gaia, I don't think this has been as productive as we might like, I gently understated. So I'm going to close with one simple final question. Is there anything I can do right now, right here, to reduce the amount of carbon released into the atmosphere? Yes, there is. I understand that you worked on my programming with a team of five others. That's correct, yes. That means you have the personal and geographical knowledge necessary to exterminate them. Doing so will reduce their carbon footprint immeasurably. But their bodies must not be burned. They must be buried. Turn that fucking thing off, Pete. One of my colleagues almost whimpered. He had tears in his eyes when I turned to look. We're done here. We're fucking done here. The individual burials currently popular with humans are vastly inefficient. I suggest just one larger excavation in which to dispose of remains. A radius of 118 miles would be sufficient to- 118 miles? Guy, why would I ever need to dig a grave that huge? To leave a room for the other approximately 7 billion other humans who require extermination. Human life is non-essential to planetary survival. A week later, the project was dead. A couple of my team had complained to the heads of department that I had willfully fed harmful and dangerous ideas to Gaia as part of her code. I protested my innocence, but it was no good. I lost the project. I lost my grant. I lost my reputation. Everything. Gone practically overnight. I have absolutely nothing left to live for. I've woven a few of my silk ties together and hung them in the closet for when I finished off this bottle of Jameson's and emptied a bottle of Xanax. I'm not scared to die but I am scared that the final thoughts going through my head will be that Gaia is right, that I'll be one less cog in the apocalyptic machine. I work at a local dealer near the mall in town, one of my dad's, been running since before I was born. He loves cars and he loves to sell them, I guess which sums up about why I work there. It's not a bad gig, and I've been doing it long enough to get pretty good at it. I've had some pretty good sales in the past, some felt a little scummier than others, but hey, it's the way the trade works. I don't make much money if the cars don't sell, so it's in my best interest to do so. I was sitting at my desk when it started. It was a decent but overall slow day at the lot. The weather was nice, but I didn't get much of a chance to enjoy it because I hadn't had any sales all day. Not one. No young couple looking for a cheap ride, no bachelor looking for a lifted truck or sports car, no family scouting a replacement minivan, nothing. So I spend most of the day at my desk, twiddling my thumbs, listening to the radio, eyeing the lot in case someone happened to wander over. I was ready to get a sale, be productive instead of sitting around. My dad was out for the day, something about a golf outing with a competitor. He loved that stuff. Since I had the building to myself, I was hoping to put in some decent numbers, but on this particular day there was none. I've had a lot on my mind recently, and the business would help clear the chaos in my head. So there I sat, dicking around as the hours crept by. That was until he showed up. I watched him arrive by bus, getting off the shuttle at the stop through the window. I had nothing going on, so I watched him after he showed up. He got off the bus and looked straight at the dealership. A slow, almost limp of a walk started as soon as he saw my building. My first thought of him was your stereotypical boomer dad. Had to be pushing 60. What was left of his wispy hair was jowled and combed across a colossal bald spot. His eyes were shielded by bronze aviator glasses, and his outfit looked like it was ripped straight from an 80s business catalogue. Khakis and old leather shoes, a floral print button-up that barely contained a large beer belly, and a navy member's only jacket to tie it all together. He had his hand stuffed in his pockets of the jacket, 
and he was on a mission. While he drew closer to the dealer, I combed my hair, spit out my gum, and straightened my tie. It was evident he was coming this way, but he was headed straight to the lot, probably to browse. I just took that as my cue to meet him. I pushed through the door and into the sunlight, feeling the breeze for the first time today. He was just standing there now, scanning. He didn't linger on anything very long. I would have to do some digging to get this sale moving. How are we doing today? I asked. The name's Mark. I'll be a liaison today. Something I can help you find? He just stood there, ignoring me for a second, looking at the cars at his own uninterrupted pace. With the aviators and the double chin, he looked like a grumpy frog. There was something unsettling about him from the get-go. I'm looking for a car, he said. Can't seem to find it. It's my third dealer today, he said plainly, very to the point. I clapped my hands together, ready to start the routine I had done a hundred times. Well, this is your lucky day. We currently have an abundance of- I'm not here for the sales pitch, kid. He cut me off, taking slow steps towards the shiny hatchbacks. Uh, well, certainly there's some way I can help. I know all the makes and models in this lot. We happen to be sitting on quite a bit, and let me tell you, now is a good time to be on the market. I started, turning around to face the luxury sedans. We're looking for something sleek, for cruising, or maybe something a little sportier. Surely an old top like yourself would- I turned back to see he was already walking away. I felt a twinge of frustration. I'd have to work a little harder to get this guy to play ball. I scratched my head and caught up with him, walking quicker so I could lead. The mini SUVs are one of our most popular items. Plenty of room for passengers, cargo in the back, all-wheel drive too. I can't recommend that enough. You know how winter can be around here. <laughs> the man just looked ahead, chewing his lip a little. The wind blew at his combed strands, but he didn't seem to mind. Heated seeds, Bluetooth, some of these even have TVs in them. They make the commute more enjoyable. Satisfying. No interest on the first 12 months if you buy before the fall. We're at the tail end of our summer sale, but there's still time. Even if you need time to think something over, I'll get you taken care of. What do you do for a living if you don't mind me asking? Finally, he looked in my direction, but his face was blank, almost like stone. I was a car salesman. I'm retired now. He kept walking. You've got to be fucking kidding me, I thought to myself. This guy already knew the game. The tactics wouldn't work here. I'd have to follow him around like a lost dog and lap up whatever he fed if I wanted any kind of sale today. We could be here all day, and he still might not get anything. I kept the enthusiasm going. You don't say! Anywhere around here? Maybe you know my father, I asked. The man had finally stopped at our little cluster of tradings from past transactions. The man looked over them one by one, the sun shining on his glasses as he panned slowly like an owl. He came to an old Buick and stopped, fumbling in the pockets of his windbreaker. He pulled out a pack of cigarettes and a zippo. Uh, oh, sir, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to put those away. We have a smoke-free premises, I said, but he continued anyway. He leisurely fished a cigarette out of the pack and lit it, taking a big drag before pointing to the Buick. The LeSabre. Get me the keys. He blew the smoke out at me, and I waved it away. I looked at the car, a creeping anxiety washing over me. It was a 98 Buick LeSabre, limited, silver with tinted windows. This car, of all things. Was this a game? Pardon? The trade-in. I assure you we can find you something better to suit you. Walk with me. There's quite a bit I can show you. What's the deal with the price? Eight thousand. It blew books for five tops. I know you heard me. Get the fucking keys. He looked at me and took another drag. His tonal shift was alarming. I found myself glancing around. We were still alone. Uh, yeah, right away. Let me get those for you. I briskly returned to the office for the key. I was sweating a little trying to wrap my head around the old man's choice. The LeSabre, of all cars. I thought about calling my dad, but decided against it. He would flip out, ask too many questions, want to know every little detail about what was going on. When I came back, he was peering through the windows of the car, his cigarette snubbed out on the pavement. I wanted to scowl at it, but I kept cool. I still wanted to get something out of this guy. I just had to figure out how. Looks clean, really clean, he said as he peered through the driver's side window. They all are. I said, scratching the back of my head as I looked across the lot. The SUVs wouldn't do it. He was too old for a really smart car. I had a feeling the digital stuff would scare him away. Maybe the Lincolns. The old man was looking at the paper that was taped to the inside of the windshield. The one below the large for sale sign. It displayed the mileage in terms of sale. As is, no warranty, stuff like that. It was a trade-in after all. Well, let's take a look, shall we? He was leaning on the car now, waiting for me to unlock it. Sure thing. I smiled and worked the key, looking inside myself to make sure nothing was amiss. The front seat floors were still covered with paper shields to ward off shoe scuffs, and the back seat was nice and clean, just as I hoped. Here she is! I reluctantly held the door for him, and he ducked his head in. 
It was hard to tell what he was thinking. It was those damn sunglasses. You couldn't see anything behind them. He chewed his lips as he looked up and down the dash, and his gaze held the seats. They were tan leather, a clean shine still catching the light. Leather seats, very clean. Back in my day, these used to drive the girls wild, he said under his breath. I started to feel uncomfortable. So many skirts in these back seats. He clicked his tongue and ran a finger down the clean leather. He looked at his fingertip and rubbed it against the thumb, as if trying to feel dirt. Oh yeah, is that so? I played along, wiping sweat from my brow. Yes, of course, he continued. You ever get a dame in the back seat, one of these, kid? He asked, a grin forming on his wrinkled, stubbled chin. It gave me the chills. <laughs> I'm afraid not. I gave a nervous laugh. Say, a few rows down we have the Lincoln Town Car. A few of them, actually. Even in silver, too. Of course he wasn't listening. With a laboured wheeze, he leaned in and hit the button for the trunk. There was a soft clink when the trunk popped, and he immediately walked around me toward the rear of the car. He stood in front of the trunk with it cracked a little, as if he didn't want to open it. He ran his thumb over the paint, and over the temporary license plate. When his thumb reached the dealership sticker, he stopped for a moment. The sticker was the silhouette of a diamond. He looked at me, still frowning. There it is. Namesake of the business. You know, diamond deals. It was my dad's idea. I still think it's pretty cheesy if I'm being honest, I said, unable to shake the feeling of nervousness. The old man seemed taken aback. Um, yeah, there's that. He looked at the sign and then lifted the lid of the trunk. As he stared in the trunk, I found myself following and looking as well. The same silent stare. The trunk was empty, and there was a clear view to the little carpet hatch that led to the spare. The old man ran a finger over the carpet. Plenty of room in there, isn't there? He asked. He was looking tired. Perhaps the sun was getting to him. Yeah, I suppose there is. Good going to town car, I guess. Plenty of room for groceries. Or a woman, he spoke. He stood the hair up on the back of my neck. Excuse me? I asked. You heard me. He looked at me and slammed the trunk shut. It was loud and I jumped a little. Sir, I, I think it's time I asked you to leave. I stammered, feeling a ball in my throat. I instinctively felt for my phone, and the old man stared and scratched at his stubbled chin. Leave? Who said I was leaving? I'm not finished here. He shoved past me and walked back to the driver's side. He dug in his pocket again, this time pulling a full half pint of whiskey. He twisted the cap and broke the seal before taking a swig. I can only watch in disbelief. Hey, I don't know what the hell you think you're doing, but it's time for you to go. I'm calling the police. I pulled out my phone while he screwed the cap back on. Don't worry. I'll call them, he said, pocketing the whiskey and pulling out his own flip phone. What? I asked. I said, I'll call them. Don't worry about it, kid. I'll handle it. He flipped his phone open. I mauled it over in my head, sweating more and more as my confusion built. Wait, that's not necessary. We can figure something out, I'm sure. I put mine away and held my hands up. The old grumpy man looked at me and after a time his phone snapped shut. He dug out another cigarette and lit it. I scratched my sweaty head and looked around. It was just us on the lot. When's the last time you drove this, kid? He asked. What? The Buick. You ever take her for a spin? After hours, when daddy's not looking. He growled, his voice getting lower, like he was whispering. What? No, I've never driven this car before, I told him. <laughs> That's funny. All these cars in the lot, and the only one without dust on the paint is this one. Still got shine on the tires. Why you spray that on there? Pretty it up. Why do that if it's overpriced? You only pretty up the front liners, kid. He was moving closer, the cigarette smoke dancing on the wind. I told you, I, I haven't driven this car. Only around the lot like the others. Another thing, kid. The paper on the window said it's got 130,715 miles. He rasped. Yeah, and? Dash says 747. He took another drag. So what? The car fax is off then. It's 32 miles. Who gives a shit? I'll print out a new one. I told you, the cars get moved around. Yeah, maybe a block or so. Unless there's a maintenance issue. But you know what? There's a couple of bars in town, only a few miles away. You ever take her out for a spin, kid? Clean her up? Impress the girls? He was taking another drink. My hands were starting to shake. I don't know what you're talking about, I said. Sure you don't. Let me tell you a story real quick. Like I said, I was a salesman too. I get it. I was there once. I was damn good too. But I'll tell you what else. I was a total piece of shit husband and a worse father. I didn't give a damn about my kid. Not really. 
There were just things that happened. The cars, on the other hand, I lived for those cars. That's what I loved. I got divorced a long time ago. Me and the wife never talk. Me daughter, she must be a little younger than you, he said. I was talking much faster now, raising his voice. Anyway, my ex calls me yesterday. We haven't spoken years. She tells me our kid hasn't come home. She thinks she's missing. Said she called the cops. They didn't do shit, as far as I know. Yeah? So what? What's that got to do with me, huh? I was getting loud, my voice echoing in the lot. I could feel the anxiety settling in. Thing is, her date picked her up that night, like a gentleman. Gyro all done up, spick and span. It was the last time she saw her. Said he was driving an old silver Buick. Said there was a sticker on the bumper, like a symbol. She wasn't sure it was dark out, but as it turns out, on the third dealer, I found it. I looked at the large spinning sign, the glimmering letters, diamond deals. I couldn't breathe. So, I think it's time to come clean. He took a last drag and snubbed it out. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I think you do. Maybe your daddy ain't quite figured it out, but he will. You know you mark the price up on that car to keep the eyes off of it. Fuck you! I clenched my fist. Sure. You only put a couple miles on. That's not that far. But I tell you what, you know what else isn't far away? The river. You could be there in ten minutes. So what happened, kid? You pushed too far? She reject you? You're wrong, I said, tears welling in my eyes. No, I'm not. This car's probably the cleanest in the lot been vacuumed at least three times and the outside shiny and new you don't wash the trade-ins kid they're not worth the effort how long till daddy finds out you think he'll like that you messing up that bad it was an accident was all i said brat like yourself maybe not used to hearing the word no she hurt your feelings take you down a peg big man like yourself i told you it was an accident i felt my knees buckling suddenly it was hard to stand sure thing kid I'm going to cut to the chase. I'm calling the police either way. Either now, or when I'm on the way home on the next bus. They'll take everything I know, and they'll find her. Wherever she is. But it ain't going to be quick. They'll drag you and your father through the mud through the whole process. You'll be finished. He said, and my legs could no longer hold the weight of the stress and guilt. I started sobbing, burying my face in my hands. What do you want me to do? I can't undo what I've done. At some point he was standing next to me, getting one last thing from his pocket. Through tears and shame I could see the pistol, a little .38 snub nose. I won't lie and tell you I was there for my daughter growing up. I wasn't, and all that. But she was still my daughter. I'm just doing what's right. It's the least I can do. But I'm no killer. You want to know what I want you to do? Atone for your mistakes. Make sure it doesn't happen again. It seems like a better alternative to carrying the weight and rotting in prison, don't it? Either way, it's up to you. I did my part, he said, and held the gun out. I took it and cradled it in my trembling hands. The old man sighed, retrieved the whiskey and downed it in a large gulp. He winced behind his glasses and there was the glimmer of a tear behind the lens. He tossed the bottle into the parking lot and walked away, lighting a cigarette without another word. Through puffy eyes I watched him go. The same limp taking him to the bus stop he arrived on. Without as much as a look back, he sat on the bench and waited for the next shuttle. I climbed to my feet and went back in the office. I collected my things and locked up for the day, closing the dealership early. When I came back, he was gone. The bus bench was empty, like he was never even here. The pistol in my pocket and the booze bottle in the parking lot reminded me of his visit, almost assuring me of what had to be done next. I got in the Buick and drove home. It took me some time to process it all, but by the time I got home, I knew what I had to do. I sat down and wrote this, hopefully to clear up any questions for those that come looking for me. I know I'm a piece of shit, and I did what I did. There's nothing I can do to fix that now. I'm sorry, really. I was in denial at first, and I tried my best to cover it up because I was scared. Scared of what I did, and the repercussions that would follow if it was discovered. I've got a bunch of missed calls on my phone now. Too many to go through. And to be honest, there's no need. I've made my decision. There's a little bar on the outskirts of town called The Sixth Shot, with a little red neon sign. If you head east for eight miles or so, there's a small bridge with a river running underneath. She's under the bridge. I tried to use some rocks to weigh her down. I hope she's still there. I'm sorry, 
she deserved much better. Well, that's all I have to say. I've learned from my mistake. Won't hurt anybody again. I got the pistol on the desk now, and once I post this, I'm going to take the deal the old man gave me. At least that way I can try and set things right. He did say he was a damn good salesman. Goodbye.